Okay. Uh, we're going to uh, continue with uh, chapter uh, P3. Uh, and after you go through the notes, I want to spend time uh, finishing up the homework for uh, for P2 as well as start. Well, sorry, I don't think we'll, we'll be able to start P3 homework today. I think there's quite a bit of uh, uh, concepts I want to go over with you. And then um, tomorrow uh, I have a worksheet for us. We'll work a worksheet in the packet. And then if we have time, we'll continue uh, working on homework. And so that um, you know, when I check uh, your homework Monday, uh, it won't feel like you have a lot to do over the weekend. Hopefully it's just a few problems um, to, to finish up uh, for me to check on Monday. So, uh, you know, every day uh, this is all worth one homework assignment. So I'm going to check it all on Monday. Uh, it'll be three homework assignments I'm checking on Monday. And then for Monday, uh, once we get to Monday, we'll be done with chapter P. Uh, we're not having a test over chapter P, but there is a lot of these useful concepts that that's going to help us with our uh, foundational knowledge before moving to our true um, first unit, which is uh, limits. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me just read through some of these notes here. Domain domain is a set of all values of X where our function is defined. Uh, restrictions can vary depending on the, func the function type. The rational functions, radical functions, trig functions, they all have different restrictions. Um, and a lot of times we don't have to look at the graph to find the domain. We can uh, use parent graph uh, information. We can um, use algebraic steps to find out where the restrictions are and from there determine what the domain is. Now, range is the set of all the y values uh, that exist for the graph. Now, with range, it's a little bit more difficult to algebraically figure out without looking at the graph. So typically, we need to look at what the what the picture of the graph is before uh, we can determine the range. But sometimes, uh, if we use transformation and um, if we know knowledge about parent graphs, sometimes we're able to determine what the range is how far high and how far low the graph stretches um, to find the range without having to graph it. But usually uh, range requires us to look at the graph first. All right, so transformation. Uh, let me go over the, the basic um, details about transformation and we'll look at uh, an example that um, uh, I will show you. So transformation is what we do to a function um, in terms of stretching it, moving it, shifting it, um, where we can gather information uh, from the original fu fu a function. And then uh, using transformations, we can have an idea of where that graph is going to be and how it's going to look. So assuming that uh, the parent graph is f of x, then uh, these different things can be done to a graph and we'll have an idea uh, what those things or how those things are impacting the graph. So first is the negative. Okay? If you see a negative in front of a function, that's going to take this original function and it's going to flip it over the x-axis. It's going to make it um, kind of reflect over the x-axis. Okay. Next is if you see a number in front of the f of x, in front of the function, could be two, could be three, could be one third. That's going to take what, what's going to happen is it's going to take that function and it's going to either stretch it vertically or it's going to compress it vertically. Okay. The graph is going to look the shape is still look the same, but it will look like a like a wider version of it or a more narrow version of it. Next up is that is if I have a value inside the function that's being added or subtracted. That's going to take the graph, the parent graph, and it's going to shift it either left or right. Uh, but it's a little bit counterintuitive because um, 
if we go left, we're going to see a positive sign. If we go right, we're going to see a negative sign. And that's the reason why that's counterintuitive is we usually associate right with positive and left with negative, but everything inside the parentheses is kind of opposite. So if you see a plus sign, if you see plus two, that's going to shift this parent graph left two units. If you see a minus four, that's going to shift the graph to the right four units. Okay. And finally, um, if I have a value that is completely outside the function, it's going to take the graph and it's going to shift it up or down. Now, shifting up and down is more straightforward. If you see a positive number, that's going to shift the graph that many units up. If I see a negative number, that's going to shift the graph down. Okay, let me see if I can squeeze in uh, an example in this space here. Let's say I had y equals x squared. That's a parent function. That's a parabola that goes through a vertex of 0, 0, and it opens up. Okay. But let's say we have a transformation of this function. And let's say um, we have a function that was this. y is equal to negative 3 x minus 2 squared plus 1. Now, if you look, you see some general characteristics that are the same, right? These are both involving quadratic. These are both parabolas. But the negative, the 3, the 2, and the 1 is going to take this parent graph that's going to do stuff to it. Okay, And let's talk about what those things are. The nice thing about transformation is you can have a, a really quick idea of where the graph is without having to painstakingly look at every single order pair and graph every single point. So a couple things that we notice here. What's the negative going to do to this graph? Yep, flip it. What's the three going to do to it? Stretch. Stretch. Okay, so the negative and the three, they look like just one thing, but it's two separate things. The negative is doing one thing, three is doing one thing. The three is going to stretch the graph vertically. Okay. What is this minus two going to do to this graph? Shift it right, and the one is going to shift it up. Okay. So really, if I just follow the path of this starting point, then I can really sketch out the rest of the graph. It doesn't have to be perfectly uh, accurate, but the nice thing about transformations is we can get a quick feel for the graph um, without having to look at every single point. So. I know my graph is shifting to the right two and up one, so I'm just going to follow this easy point for me to follow. So I'm going to or to to track. So I'll move it that starting point, right two and up one. That's the center of my parabola, but we know it's going to be opening down because of the reflection, and it's going to stretch at three. So we're just going to make it a little bit wide, a little bit more narrow. So it doesn't have to be accurate, but we're just demonstrating how these uh, transformations can get us to a quick look of the graph. OK, okay any questions with that? That's just a, a quick example of, of how we can apply transformations um, and get, get a ballpark uh, picture of the graph. All right, next up, um, compositions of functions. Uh, this is where if we insert a function into another function, um, we can determine the domain, but we want to determine the domain before simplifying. So let's go ahead and practice finding the domain of these functions. Okay, so first is 3x squared. That's a parabola that opens up. We know the graph is going to stretch infinitely to the left and to the right without a break. So we know the domain is negative to positive infinity, right? It's just basically a, a, a more narrow version of, um, of a x squared, but the domain will be the same. Next step, y equals uh, square root of x minus 2. Let's talk about what this graph looks like. Okay? Uh, let me um, give you a visual as to what the parent graph looks like. So y equals square root of x looks like this. Starts at zero, zero, and it's going to rise to the right, but it's going to kind of flatten out as it continues. I mean, it's still rising, but it's just the, the rise is going to become a lot more gradual as it moves to the right. 
but that's what square root of x looks like. What do you think square root of x minus two is going to look like if we know that's the parent graph? Shift it. Right. Yep. So imagine a graph that looks like this. So we have a quick view of y equals square root of x minus two. What's the domain of this function in red? Two to infinity. Yep. Two to infinity. It, does it have? Does it? Uh, is it bracket or parentheses at two? Bracket. bracket. It actually reaches that point, so we're going to include that point in our domain. So two to infinity. Okay, next up, determine f of g of x. So f of g of x, this is a composition of functions. What we're doing is we're inserting the g of x into the f of x. So g of x is the inside function. We're going to insert into the outer function. So what we're going to do is that g of x, I'm going to circle what g of x is. That's the square root of x minus 2. I'm going to insert this into the f of x function. So what the way we do that is, we're going to insert this into the x of the original function. Sorry, of the outer function. So wherever I see an x for the outer function, I'm going to remove it. And in place of it, I'm going to put this g of x, the root x minus 2. So this is what our function looks like. Any questions so far? OK, now we're going to find the domain. But we're going to find the domain before simplifying. Okay? If I simplify this, then it'll just become 3 times x minus 2, and I really lose the restriction that's part of this function. So we're going to focus on the domain at this point in time. Now, the domain of this is going to be the the, the more restrictive of the two domains. And we see that um, the more restrictive of the two domains is, domains is from 2 to infinity, because if I insert any number less than 2, uh, that square root is going to give us an issue. Okay, So the domain is going to take the mo more restrictive of these two, and the domain of this comp composition is going to be from 2 to infinity. Let's skip number two for now and let's go to the back page. Okay, uh, back page here, next page. Uh, we talked about uh, symmetry, about the y-axis, symmetry about the origin. Uh, here's just another uh, way of saying it. Um, uh, symmetry about the y-axis is considered an even function. Symmetry about the origin is considered an odd function. So um, the process is the same. It's just it's worded a little differently here. An even function is where if I replace every x with negative x, can I make my way back to the original function? So uh, we did that on the first day. Let's continue with that step here. So if I want to test for symmetry, typically uh, a good candidate for an even function is one where you have an even power. It doesn't mean that every even power is an even function. But um, those are just um, the, e uh, the easier candidate for us to kind of um, have an idea of where to where to go. So I see the x squared. I think that's a good candidate for even function. Let's test it out to see if it is truly a function that's symmet symmetric about the y-axis. So I'm going to take every x I see and replace with negative x. That's what this is saying. Replace every x with negative x. I'll replace that x with y just so I can have it as a function um, that's more recognizable. I 
And am I able to work back to the starting equation? Yes, good. So that's the easy one here. Therefore, we're able to fulfill our condition. We're able to get back to our starting point. So therefore, um, f of x is an even function. Okay, let's uh, look at part B, odd function. So the rule says replace every x with negative x, but the end result is going to be the negative version of the original function. So um, I feel like the more uh, the way that we did it before is, is maybe easier to think about. What that means is uh, replace x and y with negative x and negative y. And then see if that will go back to original. If it does, then we're dealing with an odd function. Okay. If it doesn't, then we know it's not an odd function. So let's do that. I'll replace the x's with negative x. I'll replace the y with negative y. I want to see if I can make my way back to the, our, to the starting point. Uh, the negative 2 and the negative x cubed, right? This will stay negative, so the two negatives gives me positive. Not exactly the same yet, but what can I do to further test it out? Yeah, divide or multiply by negative one. There we go. It matches the function exactly. We know we're dealing with a odd function here. We, we tested it out and it works. And uh, we're able to get that verified. So usually um, it's not there's some exceptions, but usually if all of your powers are even, then chances are um, it'll end up being an even function. So if you look over here, x squared has a power of two. Five has a power of what? X to the not one, but Five, the same thing as 5x to the zero power. So um, we know x is zero power, this just goes away, but technically five is considered an x power of zero. So that's even, right? So anytime, if, if I see all even powers, it's usually a good sign that it'll probably be an, an even function. And likewise, if every variable in my function is odd, that's usually a pretty good indication that we're dealing with an odd function. Now, this is obviously odd, which is three. What's the power for this x? One. Okay, so it's hidden, but it is an odd number. So it um, doesn't mean that it's always going to work. But there are some exceptions if we're dealing with fractional values, but uh, by and large, um, that's a quick way to to see if uh, usually it's I would say about you know eighty percent, ninety percent of the time that is the case. OK, um, there's three uh, big topics that I want to go over. Piecewise functions, absolute value functions, and then um, substitutions involving functions. So um, we'll see this in our homework, and we're also going to see um, uh, some of these uh, concepts come back to us uh, as we move into uh, the further units of calculus. OK, so piecewise functions. All right, so what is a piecewise function? Piecewise function is where we have different graphs all on, all showing, or different uh, functions all showing on the same graph, but we want to make sure that there are no conflicts between the graphs. Okay. 
So for instance, so uh, let's say I had a parabola, okay, and then let's say I had a linear graph. If I put both of them onto the same graph, I'm not looking at a function there, right? Because I have all these places where vertical line test is going to fail. But what if I'm able to restrict and just show part of each graph? What if I was just saying, okay, just show me the parabola, but only show me the parabola up to this point. And then for the line, don't show me the entire line, show me the line, but only up to, you know, a certain point. Now that's a function because no matter where you drop a vertical line, um, we don't have any conflict, right? We're, we're never touching more than one point as we drop a vertical line. So that's what the piecewise function does, okay? It allows for different parts of different functions to all sit on the same graph, and we can still call the function because none of those segments are overlapping each other. So uh, we're going to practice graphing this piece, piecewise function. And notice that we're not graphing the entire linear and the and the radical because we're only graphing portions of it, right? So the one minus x is only living to the left of one, and the square root of x minus one is going to only live to the right of, of one. All right, so here's the strategy that we're going to use to graph each of these functions. We'll do a t-chart for both. We'll tackle the one minus x first. Now, I only want to show the one minus x when x is less than one. So what are some values less than one? Zero, negative, negative one, negative two. Okay. So we'll, we'll start there. Zero, negative one, negative two. But here's the thing that I want us to make sure that we do. Even though we see the word, even though it's less than, which means that this graph is it ever going to touch one, this first one will ever reach one. It won't, right? It's, but but it will get infinitely close to it. So we still want to graph this point, but just understand that there is a hole at one. Okay. So what I mean by that is we still want to include one. I think the natural tendency is we, we just say to ourselves, well, if it's less than one, I'm going to start at zero. But if you're starting at zero, that means you're this whole gap from zero to one that needs to be included that you're not including. Right? So we'll, we'll put a one here to indicate that we are getting as close to it as possible. We don't have to fill in the, the circle. We can just call it a hole for that one. OK, so this should give us an idea how the graph's going to look. We know it's a linear graph. So I'm going to insert one in for x and find out the y value there. So one in for x, one minus one is zero. 1 minus 0 is 1, 1 minus negative 1 is 2, and 1 minus negative 2 is 3. Start the graph here. I know that I'm getting close to one, but I'm never reaching it. So I need to make sure I graph that point and put an open circle there. Okay, let's move on to the other graph here. Y equals square root of X minus one. Now we only want this graph to live on the other side of one. Okay. So let's create a T table here and indicate the values that we want to graph. Okay, we're going to start at one. Is we always want to include the boundary of our of our um, statement. And then some numbers greater than one, we can test two, three, four. And insert all these x values into the appropriate function. So one minus one, zero. Square root of zero is zero. Insert two in for x, two minus one is one, square root of one is one. 
And so three and for X, three minus one is two. Square root of two is around 1.2-ish. And then four, four minus one is three. It's like around 1.5-ish. All right, we kind of have an idea how the graph's gonna look, right? Square root of X minus one, it's gonna kind of curve upward, but it's gonna slope, it's gonna gradually slope uh, less and less. So uh, one zero, now one zero, it actually does live at this point. So we see that the hole that was initially there is now getting filled in. So it just happens to be that way. Two, one, three squared, two and four squared three. Now it's not guaranteed that every piecewise function is going to fill in the hole. It's just that's just the, the way it, it happened to, to be. We're just gathering information and plotting whatever the graph is supposed to look like. Okay, so now that we have the graph in front of us, we're going to find the domain and the range. We're going to look at this as one uh, function. And what is the overall domain? of this picture here. Negative to positive. Negative to positive, right. There was a hole here, but it's getting filled in very nicely with, uh, with a, a second function. So it doesn't end up looking like there's any, any breaks in terms of the X value. So domain is all real numbers. Now range is talking about Y values. Right? Range is talking about how low the, uh, does the graph go and how high does the graph go in terms of the y value? So what's the lowest y value that you see overall on this graph? Zero. Zero. Okay. And how high does it reach? Infinity. infinity right. These both arrows, both these arrows are going to infinity, um, but we should need to track one of them. And that's going to take care of everything above the x-axis. So zero to infinity. We always put parentheses around infinity, but for zero, we're going to put bracket. It actually does touch the x axis, so we need to in, um, indicate that. Okay, uh, let's look at absolute value functions. Absolute value function. First off, absolute value function is a, a graph that has a V shape to it. So, absolute value of x is a V right side up. If I have y equals negative absolute value of x, guess what? Guess how that graph's gonna look? It's still V shape, but it's gonna go down. Yeah, it's gonna go down. Yes. Now, absolute value function kind of has its own rules, uh, and it's a little bit cumbersome to work with, uh, also from a calculus perspective. So. What we like to do is if we see absolute value function, we tend to like to think of it as two lines that happens to end and start um, and meet up. Okay. So we can think of a absolute value function as a piecewise function. Let me just give you a, a quick visual here. So imagine I had two lines. A line with a positive slope and a line with a negative slope. Now we can tell that this is obviously not a function, right? You have these two lines that are overlapping, and vertical line test is going to fail. But what if for each line I'm able to restrict it? So let's say for this line here, I only want to show uh, what's on to the left of zero. And I'm just going to restrict the graph and only show to the left of the x-axis or the y-axis. And then for this graph here, let's say I'm only going to show a portion of the line that is to the right of zero. So I'm going to get rid of this piece. And the resulting shape is an absolute value function. So we're basically, we're taking two lines, restricting it, and making it so that it looks like the absolute value function. Because it is, we can basically call this a, 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 a substitution for an absolute value function. And the reason why we want to do this is because it's a lot easier to work with linear functions 
than it is with absolute value. We're going to do things with the uh, uh, regular function, like derivatives and integrals, and it's a lot easier to play with polynomials than it is to, to have a, a deal with the absolute value function. So let me talk about uh, how this graph is created using the rules here. So what we do is we say, okay, I'm going to rewrite this over here. Y equals. We know uh, how the graph is already going to look. It's going to be right side up. Now there's going to be a positive version of it. And that's going to live to the right of zero. So we say X is greater than zero. That takes care of that branch. Now there's also a line with a negative slope. So we say negative X to talk about this part of the graph. But this line is not extending forever, right? It's only getting up to that zero, uh, but it's only living to the left of zero. So we say X is less than. Okay. Now there's one piece missing, and that piece is what's happening at zero. I need an equal sign. So where do I put the equal sign? In the first piece wise or the second one? So here's the thing. It doesn't matter which one you put it on. As long as you put it on one of them, that's good enough. So I can put it with the first one here, or I can put it with the second one here. They're both meeting at the same point. So as long as you tell one of them to define at that point, you're good. Um, Okay, so let's practice writing out a piecewise function for something that is in absolute value function form. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to get an idea what the, this picture is going to look like. Is this graph going to be opening up or down? We know it's a V, right? Is it a V right side up? Oh, yeah. So I'm going to put this to the side here. I know I have an idea how the graph is going to look. Now, the restriction. Okay, how do we find the restriction? How do we know where the where the uh, the line is going to end and then the other one's going to start? So the way we find that uh, uh, restriction, like how we did above, is we're going to set the expression equal to zero. That's going to tell us where the v, where the uh, the sharp, the vertex of this graph's going to be, where the line is going to stop and where the other one's going to begin. So we'll set 2x plus 6 equal to 0. Solve for x. What's x equal to? Negative 3. So we have an idea how the graph's going to look. I'm just going to do a really rough sketch of it. I know that at negative 3, the two lines are going to meet and the v is going to be formed. Okay, any questions so far? Now, we're going to create a piecewise version of this function, knowing that it's just two lines with um, a starting and ending point for both. So, squiggly to indicate that we have two functions to deal with. So, the two functions are easy to, uh, to find. One will just be the exact same as what you see here, but just drop the absolute value. Now, this 2x plus 6, is this talking about the graph, this line to the right, or is it talking about the line to the left? The line to the left. Okay. The hint is here. The hint is the 2. What is that? 2 is the what? Okay. Uh, but what does it mean, though? So it's slope. Slope, right? It's a positive slope. If you look at this graph here, we always read the graph from left to right. We see the positive slope is to the right of negative three. So that tells us this branch is talking about the branch to the right. So we say greater than negative three. That means to the right of negative three. We want this 2x plus six to show up 
on the right side of that vertex. So the one on top is the one to the right. So the one here is the one to the right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But now, I'm saying the one we put on the top of the the brackets. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So I like to do that. I like to put the first one to be the positive version of it. Now the absolute value also has a negative version of that expression. So it'll look like this. Basically, you just put a replace the absolute value with a set of parentheses. If I distribute the negative through, what's that going to make this line? A slope of what? Negative two. And we can tell that negative slope is going to be on the other side of that negative three. So we say x is less than negative three or to the left of negative three. We want the, the line with the negative slope to be on the left side of negative three. We want the positive slope line segment to be on the right side of negative three. And where can we put the equal sign? Either one, okay. either one, bottom, top, choose one and make sure you define it somewhere. They're both meeting at the same point. You just want to just arbitrarily give one the responsibility of defining it. Yes. So the second one, why are you this? That's right. The second one would have a line of negative six because if I were to, now the graph isn't fully showing, but if I were to extend this graph down, it will get negative six out here. But we're restricting it, so the line of step is not going to show up. But it is still technically y intercept negative six if you were to extend that line down. Okay. I have a blank page on numbers on page six, and I want us to explore something here. I want us to explore a uh, uh, function or substitution involving functions. So let me start off with an easy example. Have you guys uh, make some observations about this? And then we can build uh, the um, uh, more complicated uh, example that I want to talk about. Okay, let's say I had a function 3x minus 5x squared minus 2. If I asked you to find f of 1, can you verbalize how you would go about doing this? Okay, okay I'm going to write that down. Right, I'm going to write down what we just said. Um, Plug in one in for what? X. Okay, so what you've done is you've substituted, right? You removed X. In place of the X, you put a one. Okay, it seems obvious, but I want to have us establish that knowledge before we look at more complex examples. So this is what I'm doing, right? I'm replacing every X really with a set of parentheses and allowing that space to be filled with a one. And if I just clean up that value, uh, okay, so the, uh, the resulting value is not that important. I want us just to understand, um, right, this we get, right? No issues there, okay? So what if I did this? Find f of 2 plus f. I want you to use the same logic here. How would you find f of 2 plus m? Plug in 2 plus m. Good. Plug 2 plus m in for x. x. Yep. So I'm removing x. In place of it, I'm play, putting in 2 plus m. Okay. 
It's more complicated, but the concept is the same, right? We're moving something and then we're putting something in place of it. Okay. So this is what I want us to be able to do here. Find f of x plus h. Okay. Verbalize it the same way. Yes. Remove the x and in place of it, put in x plus h. So I like to do this. I like to force myself to put all the um, all the parentheses in place. That way. I'm never going to put the exploitation in the wrong spot. I'm, I'm, I'm limiting to myself where I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to make a mistake because that parentheses is obviously where the exploitation goes. Are you okay with this? Okay, let me do one more. Let me let me do one more type of example here and see if you guys can follow this uh, same logic. Now, let's say I had a different function. Okay, try this and let's see. And I'll I'll walk through it, but I want you guys to try it first, and then we can talk about um, if you're able to still follow the same logic here. Okay, so someone want to say what they got? Good. Three over five minus two. Right. Good. So hopefully that makes sense because this is what a lot of students have done in the past, where if I ask for f of x plus h, they would write it this way. That's not what we're doing, right? We are substituting. We're taking something out and we're substituting in place where that thing was. We don't want to just put a plus H randomly um, at the end, right? That's not what it's doing. OK, good. Um, all right. Let's try this one here. Okay. Same concept, but now we're going to be kind of expanding what we're going to be doing here. Find a value. OK. Our goal is to try to get this piece out of function notation. So I want to find a replacement for f of x. I want to find a replacement for f of x plus h. And I want to um, try to remove all that function notation. In place of it, I want the ex I want the expression. So I know what I can do with f of x, right? That's easy. I can replace this with 3x plus 7, right? That's easy. But let's build f of x plus h first. Okay, so try that. See if you can find f of x plus h. And once you have that, then we can insert the numerator with those substitutions. So if f of x is 3x plus 7, what's f of x plus h? Okay, 
Not quite. OK. F of x plus h is not 3x plus 7 plus h. We've got to go through the substitution, right? It's 3x plus 7 in parentheses. So let's go back to what we were talking before, right? F of x is 3x plus 7. Right? So x plus h is going to do what? Replace it. It's going to replace x. It's going to replace x. I'm going to remove the x. In place of it, that big gaping hole is reserved for the x plus h. All right? That's what I did up here. Right? I took, I replaced every x with a set of parentheses, and in place of it, I put x plus h. So we do the same thing here. All right, I know the natural tendency is you want to add that plus h somewhere else, but the x plus h is going to replace the x of the original function, right? You're removing something and then you're putting something back where that thing was. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So now if I want to build this entire expression, I'll put this piece here. And I'll put this piece here. Okay, we'll pick this up tomorrow. Um, you guys can get your phone. Yeah. I'm going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm checking Monday, so you guys can make progress, or uh, uh, I think we'll get to some of the homework problems tomorrow in class.